Hey guys, Luna here, and we are back with Hive Swap Friend Sim. Now, we had an interesting encounter with the Rust Blood, and now we're going to go into of cleanliness and cloudiness of the other half. Like I, like, I made a prediction that the, the person who's arguing was actually with this purple blood Carrick, but I don't know for sure. So, having learned the dangers of using public thoroughfares, you've taken to dodging down bypasses and shock shocking in rear areas, trying to spy out individuals who look ripe for friendship while avoiding the more clinically insane dozens. <sighs> now you're just following a winding footpath through the undergrowth surrounding a neighborhood where the local hives are spaced far apart. <laughs> That's, yeah, <laughs> You come creeping along this footpath for safety, you should have known better. The undergrowth here is like the most of the other life forms of Hunteria, involved to ruthlessly purge the gene pool of the weak and the reasonable. Coiled as spring-loaded its stalks with foot-long thor thorns flanked with writhing bushes and with razor-sharp leaves, which in turn crowd tent tentacled flora with toothed lobes oozing liquid that hiss and smokes when it touches the ground. That just sounds god awful. <laughs> Extreme caution is needed, just as it's needed in every circumstance on this planet. When your while well, your time on Ateria has gone you accustomed to injuries, you still shrink from being impaled and sprung thorns and disciplined in acid. Yeah, such a yeah, it does sound extremely awful. <laughs> you should have known that eventually you would have to come up against local flora. So you proceed as discreetly, avoid, avoiding poison fronds and trying not to step on trigger roots. But suddenly your vegetation focus is interrupted. You hear footsteps on the path and then around the corner comes a small figure. Adorable. Oh god, this, <laughs> oh, this music is amusing. <coughs> Oh, I love that face. His face and horns are painted with smudged black and white marks. Despite the diminutive physique, it has some of the most impressive forwards you've seen on any troll. Then the small figure sees you too. Aww. And it's so startled, jumps a foot, impaling its horns on an overhanging tree branch and sticking there so its small legs are plump helplessly in the air. The small person's pardon and assure him that you were fo fully as started as he. You go on to explain that you are not dangerous, but that even if it were, you would not want to come to strife with a, even a small person with a, horns of both size. Look? Yes, you will be happy to help him down as long as he promises not to attack you with the many bladed weapons that are stuffed in his belts. Or with a do the dozen cans of inexp inexpensive soft drinks held in bandolars crossing his chest. Uh, uh, sure, okay. Like, yeah, sure, okay. Um, it strikes you that suddenly that a neighborhood ge neighborly jester, like helping someone or whose horns are stuck in the tree branch, can scarcely fail to kindle the light of friendship. You dare to hope that this will be the case now. Edging, edging forward, you get close enough to see that around the small clown's neck hang, hangs a dog tack, or ninety necklace. You tilt your head and crane your neck to see the writing on it. <gasps> Branya! Carrot Parada, if, if lost, call Branya Ursima. Okay, so... I'm gonna make a nose. As dog tag. Oh, that's adorable. Suddenly, this all makes sense. This carrot paired out must have been one of Branya's reject front regulars who have grown to childhood under her tender care, has gone out into the world to seek his fortune. That account for his small size, short legs, and small statue relative to his horns. Oh, that's... that's that'd be, I guess that kind of makes sense. Um... You eagerly pull out your palm husks, happy for an excuse to pester an old friend, but you got a zero signal out here. That's, yeah, that's, why am I not surprised? 
I wonder if the surrounding vegetation eats palm husk signals, just as it looks like it eats everything else. You disappointingly slip your palm husk back into your pocket. Honk. You apologize for the lie, explaining that you were surprising to find that you appear to have an acquaintance in common, whom you hope you will have time to discuss later. For now, you are ready, willing, and hopefully able to get him down. You hope you won't be offended if you slip behind him first. It's not that you object to bladed weapons or you stuff weapons of them in their belts, but you feel that ones he's wearing could ruin your luck if buried in your teller so however unintentional. You edge past the weapons, being careful also not to touch the spring thorn growing at the edge of the path uh, of the or their trigger roots. Oh, he's adorable. Once you're behind Kirk, you grasp his horns firmly and pull, withdrawing them from the tree branch, allowing him to drop lightly to the ground. Hawk! You tell him that he's very welcome, and there's a moment of awkward silence as you try to think of something else to say. Fortunately, your new provincial friend is not as devoid of social graces as you are, and gets the conversational, bo conversational ball rolling himself. That's, that's good. Hawk? That you are indeed a stranger in the in these parts, and that you actually don't fit into the any MO spectrum categories. Right, wild, right? Hello, yeah, not, not quite as stranger as used to be. You look like to think. I'm really starting to blend in with the local color. Huh? Uh, well, <laughs> well, now you know that not exhibit your blood just now. Just a couple quarts low due to the robust conditions of life on Ontario, some of which you've recently had the honor of encountering. <laughs> That's good, yeah. That's clever. Oh, you sympathize. Slinking along these hidden paths in Ontario woods can be tough on morale. The smell alone is enough to make strong men weep. That's very true. The vegetation alone looks like it was designed by the Martiques de Sade. Not that he knows who the Martiques de Sade is. You can't help but feel that it would be much better to... You can't help but feel that it would be much better if one only had a silk bo a buddy, you continue. Yes, it was always much better to have a buddy with you. How wonderful it would be to travel the these dusty flames of with a kindred spirit. A twin soul, a fellow traveler, an intimate crony. You're such a f expert on friendship spend synonyms right now. Huh? No, you haven't met anyone like that either, but you would certainly like to. Uh, yes, that's certainly yes. Friendship. Friendship's good. Your potential friend is obviously thinking seriously about this issue. You back off, give him s space, and pretend to be deeply immersed in studying one of the laser sharp leaves on one of the waving bushes around the path. You aren't one to focus yourself on others or try to unduly influence their friendship decisions. Okay, well, maybe force yourself on others in the past and try to influence their friendship decisions. Maybe you've even done this a lot, but you've recently evolved as a person. You now know that friendship is something that has to come authentically from within. Friendship is spontaneous. Real friendship sprouts naturally from the soil of mutual respect. That is very much true, and I'm glad you see it that way. The best friendships grow and ripen over the years, and are not to be rushed or forced. Of course, you've only known this small person for about five minutes, but you have to start ripening sometime. You're effectively... You're effectively thus on the theme of friendship when I'm not... <laughs> Or it suddenly from the sky above you. It's a crackling, sizzling sound, like a chitinous thing with too many legs struggling in a hot frying pan. Oh no, that does not seem good whatsoever. Hopefully, it's nothing too bad, but still. Garkia jumps so violently that he nearly gets his horn stuck in the tree again. Looking up, you see a floating metal object, vaguely toe shaped, but huge, faceless metal and numerous sets of lightning bolt shaped horns coming out of its head and neck. It's also not a sparkling conversationist. Squishlush, it remarks in a flat echoing blare. Squishlush, it elaborates further. Honk. Run, a droid! 
run in a wild panic. It's a drone! Even the Atarian badasses you've hung out with have been terrified of drones. And it's completely right so that they've been terrified. Up close, it's one of the most terrifying things you've ever seen. And it's making noises, which you didn't know that that they d even did, and which probably means something sinister. Which hopefully it's for the best. Reset at the top speed down the twisting path, focusing your senses to the breaking points to avoid trigger roots, razor leaves, and acid pods. At first you hear a pattering of small feet and feet running behind you, but as you redouble your speed the pattering falls back and after a while it's lost in the distance. Oh no, did we lose our new friends? I, I mean... You sprint for what seems like a lifetime before you finally catch your foot on a trigger root and go flying through the air, barely missing being sliced into a hundred pieces of tumbling ham by the barbed spring wire that lashes across the path, only inches behind you. You land in the dirt, it knocked out of you, but otherwise unhurt. You lie there catching your breath and catching your breath and waiting, but nothing happens. No enormous, uh, no enormous metal monster whizzes down the path to impale you. No small clown-faced individual overtakes you on your short legs. Probably for the best. Finally, after enough of nothing happens, you pick yourself up, up and dust yourself off. Who? And you're alone on the path, and no sound of either friend or potential friend or foe can be heard. No birds sing, which is probably good. You imagine that any birds naive to this forest would probably sing by croaking up putrid sludge, and th that sludge would be poisonous or radioactive. <laughs> uh, but leaving aside the character of, lo of the local fauna, what should you do? Keep on the down on the local path, putting more distance between yourself and the drone? Or should you go back and see if Karkaro is okay? Waffle for a while, then decide to go back. You sneak back along the path. You sneak a long way, but however far you go, there's no signs of either Karkar or the drone. And might be for the best, maybe? Hopefully. You don't know whether the drone picked Karkar up and took him away, or disemboweled him and scattered the fragments, or whether Karkar leapt into the undergrowth and hit or escaped, or what. One way or another, you're all alone again on this path through this shit smell forest. Oh, we're all alone. But for now, let us continue on to leap to your proto friend's aid. Leap to your proto friend's aid. Thinking quickly, you push Karkara against a large rock that juts out from the undergrowth nearby and jump in front of him, shooting from the drone with your body. I don't know if that's the best decision though, because there's a lot of... <laughs> you then pretend to be leaning against a rock in an attitude of tranquil response. Double the bladed weapons and characters blood poke you in the butt, but you don't let this show on your face. Instead, you lawn elaborately and check your wristwatch. You don't have a wristwatch, but you don't think the drones know what a wristwatch is anyways. You pretend to smoke a non-existent cigarette. Again, you're not giving anything away because either drones don't know what cigarettes are, because drones don't know what cigarettes are either. But the drone has apparently taken interest in you. It floats down between the, the trees and the undergrowth and hovers above the path several meters from where you're pretending to relax against a rock after a long day of hiking through a scenic shit smell forest. It, yeah, I would imagine it probably smells quite bad. It's quite a terrifying sight, actually. It's crucial the drone absorbs so deliciously, making Kirkler jumps that several of your eternal organs are threatened. However, you maintain what you believe the local populace would call a stiff under upper whistle pillow. It the drone's blank metal head studies you, or it could be studying something else in the opposite direction, you or even taking the drove equivalent of a piss. Can't really tell from its expression because it has no features to make expressions with. This examination or non-examination continues for some time, but your diminutive potential friend is well hidden from view, and after a while, evidently concluding that you are an inanimate object that makes unaccountable gestures with its wrists and fingers, 
the drone floats up upward again, gaining speed and, until, with a truly stricture, it whizzes off somewhere to find other hapless non-standard issues to euthanize. He's adorable and I love him so much. Uh, I'm just I love these things. When it's gone, you stand away from the rock and rub several sore places that have been pierced by bladed weapons. You turn to Kefra to comment on the recent fever, but stop when you see the look he's directing at you. A warm and admiring look. An affectionate and esteeming look. A look of friendship. Your first impulse is to throw your arms around him and lean in, but on second thought, remembering his pants arsenal, you pull out your your hand for a warm shake. Warm handshake. Victory is so close. But before you can seal the deal on this friendship transaction, you hear disturbance further down the path. God, can't the narrative chill for one single moment, especially a moment when you're about to cons consummate a beautiful friendship? That is very much true, and I would like to make sure this friendship goes swimmingly. You turn to look, the, fin the footsteps, several sets of them, get nearer, and around the bend come three figures. Three figures wearing swimming outfits, lots of gold jewelry, and discount expressions. Three figures with gills on their neck and small stylized f <gasps> fuchsia ballads. Oh man, is it possible that you finally happen upon a group of legendary sea dwellers? That's very much true. They stop short when they see you and Kakaro, obviously startled. They study you and you study them. Then Finn, Finn had Interloper 1 in a one piece and Diamond Earrings whispers to your companions and all three of them burst out laughing. Finn had Interloper 2 in a violet wetsuit and rings. Oof, I don't mind that. Uh, and, and, uh, in a violet wetsuit and ring, slaps her thighs, and Finn had interloper three in checkered swimming, uh, swimming trunks on his side. Part of you is relieved. After dries out the devil, it is the best medicine, is it? And in any event, it is better than a homicidal mania. On the other end, this laughter is unfriendly. It's cold, mocking, and super fiddlish. Bit fiddlish. These weird fellows are obviously laughing at you, not with you. Aww. Baby, it's okay. You notice that Shaker is flushing purple under his face paint, and his jaw is clenching. However, he just stares at it with stone dignity at the interlocutors. This just makes them laugh harder. <laughs> the first sea dweller says, What are you two supposed to be? Shrimp Cassidy and Squamish Kid, says her second companion. A cold bait mirror and his mutated soft shell crab, says the third. <laughs> Looks like the mineral one went down on the clown, causing it to spurt out the other one. The sea dweller's laughter is redoubled. You continue expressionless um, at these insults, but your dismay, a hero's face is taking on a harsher, glower look. You guess that the, such a tiny dude has probably been victimized by bullies his whole life, and as you happen to know, there are no bullies like Artelian bullies. Honk. You tell him. Let them talk all the shit they want. Don't let them provoke him. They're trying to get him to do something stupid. If he doesn't react, they'll get bored anyway. No way. Which is probably true. Honk. No, remember that drone? It's probably still around here somewhere. Touch your scale on their head and, uh, and you could be rendered into the mother grub's feedstock. Hey, bottom feeders. No whispering when you're in the presence of your bed. Bathers, hey little boy, put a respectful expression on your recognition surface. More like the little friend, the slender mantity over there. In fact, why are the two of you so perpendicular in the presence of the sea dwellers? You should be bowed at right anglers. <laughs> uh, the first sea dweller seems to have an affinity for cheesy ocean puns. You bow to the sea dwellers. You have your dignity, but you also not like getting killed. Oh no, don't do anything stupid. Kerker remains stubbornly upright, his face getting angry and purpler by the moment. No, my poor baby, don't do anything. The bladed weapons at his belt jingle and from in his rage trembling. Oh, see, the little clownfish, he's getting angry. Looks like he's gonna shit his pants on. What did I tell you about that face, honey? Didn't your luscus teach you anything? 
I doubt he even has the Luskus. A self-respecting Luskus would have never let a shrimp like that out of the high. Unless his Luskus is just a defective. Oh, no, don't do it. Don't do it. The Luskus cracks are too much for Kakuro. Ignoring your hissed warnings, he suddenly leaps, starling into you, into the air, drawing bladed weapons from his spells. In each his hand and hurls toward the sea dwellers. Hong Kong. Uh. So, uh, grab him by the coattails and try to keep him from presenting a disaster. That is for the best that no disaster happens. You leap forward and grab Kakuro by the coattails or by the belt. You actually are unsure what co coattail is. She says he's strong. You can barely hold him. It's like trying to restrain a small truck. His legs rotate wildly, kicking up a cloud of dust, and brandishes uses his bladed weapons wildly in the direction of the sea dwellers. It's probably for the best, and after a startled moment in which they jump backwards, the sea dwellers have started to laugh again, coming up with more stupid insults and fish buns. This is not helping. Parker runs twice as hard, honks twice as loud, and shakes his weapons twice as threateningly. Uh, hey, hey, you shout at Kakarot, trying to be heard above the Frank Frankus, holding on with all your might and jigging in your heels. You have half a mind to just let him go to pay the sea dwells back for their insults, but you have to try and keep a cool head. You're doing your proto friend much more good trying to restrain his wrath. Definitely for the best. You've now succeeded in wrapping your arms all around him, holding him with straight arms. Bellowing soothingly into his face, trying to avoid the bladed weapons he's brandishing. But it's not working! You can see the comforted features, the bare teeth, the dissented nostrils with smoke coming out, the blazing eyes, that Kakarot is getting more and more enraged. I'm glad he's angry, but like, you still gotta restrict yourself. And suddenly his rage seems to reach a kindling point. His body vibrates violently, and his eyes grow huge and red. And suddenly, from his body, something like a nuclear blast pressure wave of fear and violence sends you flying through the air like a scalp of paper and nail. What the fuck? Are you hallucinating? But you can see you soar above the path that the, su the sea dwellers aren't laughing anymore. That's probably a little spooky. In fact, they're screaming in terror and flailing wildly, blundering into razor leaves, being impaled by spring torn thorns and burning by pot acid and generally receiving the stern retribution that awaits assholes. Then your head clucks with a tree branch and you're rendered unable to narrate for a while. And that wasn't a game over. I thought that would have been a game over for sure. You wake up lying in the dust as conscious retu consciousness returns. You realize that you're lying on, s on the path as it returns further that a small clown painted figure is seated next to you. Quite calm now. He smiles fondly as he sees you sit up. Hunk! You smile in a turn. You, you express relief that you that he, he realizes you are acting in his best interest, holding him back from the finheads. And now, there are la though largely because of his unexpected burst of clown sorcery, or whatever that was, everything has turned out for the best. Kakuro holds his up his arms around hug, then remembering the blade of weapons and spells, six out of hand and you shake it warmly. Aww. Adorable little baby. <laughs> I'll see, let's leap into the fray and le lend comfort and some sport. You sport into the fr you leap into the fray in comfort and support. You would have consoled Kakra to turn the other cheek and keep turning cheek after cheek until the sea dwells got fed up and went away, but now that things have hotted up, you're not gonna let that slide. Probably for the best, maybe, I'm not entirely sure, but Kakra crashes into the sea dwellers, his bladed weapons whirling like a bell under. You scamper close behind him and kick up someone in the shin. It hurts your foot, but it doesn't seem to have any other effect. These two dwellers are made of tough stuff, or you're extremely flimsy. Science have recently pointed to the latter. 
your Hinex already is more effective ever. Thinking quickly, you pick up a rock and throw it at, at the trigger root of a spring thorn growing along the path next to where the violet bloods are enduring hurricane clown. Oh, <laughs> definitely something, that's for sure. Oil stock springs out, impaling the dude with a dozen foot long thorns. He's thrown off balance, and violent blood begins to flow conspicuously down his bo uh, body. That's a hue you haven't seen before. Hmm, kinda of pretty. But these siege rollers are made of tough stuff. He inks the spring thorn stock away from him, pulling the thorns out and flings it into the woods. He then takes out a pocket handkerchief and starts patting the injuries gently. It's... Uh, I'm sure that's probably something. Meanwhile, Kakura's bladed weapons have not been idle. The other two street dollars are likewise leaking pile of blood. But these little- these bastards are hard to kill. You remember Polya, Polya telling you that. As you watch, one of them grabs one of the blade of weapons from Kakura's hands and buries it to get- No, stop. But yeah, that is a really pretty purple. I am not going to lie. So, unsurprisingly, it's just shocking for a poor little clown. Allowing two of the Finny Sons bitches to grab a handful of bladed weapons from his belt and bury them into various parts of his body. You dance around delivering harmless kicks and curses. No, not my poor baby. Kirkra is still waving his weapons, but he seems to be waving them more slowly now. Then, as more bla and more bladed weapons are buried into his body, he seems to lose focus. The weapons he's been brandishing fall a uh, fall from his hands. I mean, it's not surprising, but still. No! Finally, he falls to the ground, and the center of a spreading pool of purple blood twitches feebly for a minute, and then he is still. Oh. That way, I did realize. You stare in relief at the corpse of one. If he had been spared just a short while longer, would have been your friend. One despite and rejected, a clown of suffering, familiar with pain. They had flogged him and mocked him and spit on him and then killed him. We struggle to come to terms with this. Uh, I mean, uh... While you're doing that, one of the remaining sweet jellers grabs you by the hair and suplexes you onto the ground. Your head steps back and pain explodes behind your eyes. You're left lying on your back, trying to stay conscious, which is why you have a good view of what's happening next. Oh, no. Hey, there's a familiar object. <laughs> In the dark sky above you, something opens. Uh, something opens. Something even darker than sky. A hole, like a cave in the clouds. It widens until you can see that in the cave carousel, with wooden horses mounted on brass posts, rotates. The horses plunging up and down in time with carnival music played by mechanical organs. I. This does not seem good. <laughs> Riding the horses are naked store store window mannequins, and their le legs slung awkwardly over the horse's back, and their stiff arms down by the sides in whatever pose they were created. Their horns huge and wildly shaped. That's <laughs> in the darkness above the carousel. Other naked. Mannequins with plastic wings tied to their backs are supported on lines, and above these, in turn, a net of white Christmas tree lights twinkle against the roof in the dark cave of circa tents, or whatever it is, throwing their dim starlight illumination down on the rotating carousel. This, uh, this does not, this does not seem great. As you watch, two of the wired mannequins break loose from the wires and fly down from that dark regimen into the night sky in their dimension Arteria occupies. They maneuver until the stiff hands on the ends of their of their stiff arms are underneath Kirkia, and then they lift him up into the sky and then into the dark carnival. I that's definitely something. As you hear the last faint of reviving bonk, honk as they set him on one of the wooden horses, and then the hole in the night sky closes, and there is nothing but the night sky above you. All is silence, and all is still again. An odd feeling comes over you. You don't think that you've ever felt such a feeling, just the reality of how utterly insignificant you are. Sure, you spent the last few months wandering with no desire but the desire for connection, and you are, in a way, 
it being unique in this galaxy. But honestly, what does that even mean? You flit in and out of people's lives. They are one, they are one minute and gone the next, always moving from friend to friends. You are, for the all intents and purposes, a virtual monetary, a bland point of view vector, a neutral second person narrator, barely coming into the picture, a retiring entity, especially only a simple one dimensional desire for friendship. But that's just about now. You feel that things have gone pretty far, and just about now you feel that you've had about enough. Enough of arrogant high bloods. <sighs> Enough, in fact, of short wavelength hemotypes carelessly and without combustion, killing and maiming and exploding those of longer wavelengths and of survival of the fittest regime that seems to come down to the survival of the most violent psychopaths. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, it's definitely true. I mean, you're not wrong, but it definitely doesn't feel nice. Enough, in fact, that you, of short wave like hemotypes carelessly that, um, uh, in the, is this the moral of the universe, or is it not, you ask yourself? Are repuls repulsive cruelty and sickening evil punishment in this universe, or are they not? Does an ethical force operate in this universe, or does it not? You don't know the answer to these questions, but you do know one thing. You intend to depart for, for the once, fin once from your one-dimensional persona. You intend to punish repulsive cruelty and sickening evil if it comes within your ability to do so. You intend to create an ethical force field in your local region. You intend to exert some moral, gra moral gravity right around where you are, if possible, if you possibly can. And you realize that this odd feeling you are having seems to be drawing moral higgs bosun out of the moral ground state and right out of the fabric of this multicolored blood-soaked planet that heaves under your feet. You take the aspect of a clown starker. Um, seizing two cans of an inexpensive soft drink from where they fell from Karkura's band oilers, you shake them and pull the pins. Then, with malice, um, the afterthought, you direct the twin streams at the sea dwellers. You smell banana and strawberry as deadly streams play upon them. Already weakened, they fall back with cries under the withering onslaught. As soon as the streams slacken, you take up two more cans, shake them, and deal death to the unrighteous. You smell peach and diet root beer this time, but no pity softens your heart. You wouldn't care even if there were pineapple watermelon you were spraying on these brutes. But these finheads are made of tough stuff. Rallying, in, rallying even in the face of this intense onslaught, they push forward and, seizing some bladed weapons from the purple blood pool, advance upon you. Not one step back, you, you vow to the memory of Kakarau Parat. You see into your ground, in desperation grabbing some cans of diet tonic water and club soda, opening you up your batteries once again, but to no avail. A trident pierces you to the bone, followed by a scimitar, a tomahawk, a short spear, and so many other bladed weapons that the sheer weight of them drives you to the ground, where your red, precious blood flows in moderate streams, mixing with the purple blood of your proto-friends. This is the end, you realize, but you're glad you died in righteous battle. You are glad you created even the tiny, sputtering, temporal, moral force field in your local region that you did. You can feel your life and narration, narrative point of view slipping away, but you're content. And yet, what that, what, yet what's that you see above you now? A dark space has opened up, even darker than the night sky, as two stiff-looking winged figures are descending. That this screen does look really interesting. They lay next to you and gently place their stiff hands under you. Then they ascend once again, lifting you higher and higher into the darker space. Oh, and everything's brightened. As you pass the boundary of the heavenly carnal, the life seems to revive within you. And as the fabric of the place closes around you, and the two stiff mannequins place you on the carousel snexic rack, you realize that the planets, universes, dimensions, 
realities, powers, princi principalities, the cosmos come and go, but friendship is forever. Aww. Shh, friendship. And with that sort of sad ending, we're, go we're gonna leave this episode here. I hope you guys have a good day, night, week, month of your lives, and may the stars forever guide your path, forever it might lead you into the future. Bye-bye.